I'm going to be presenting Cosmos, which is a virtual 3D universe in your web browser. Cosmos allows you to explore an entire universe with billions, well, trillions of stars, planets, moons, right from your web browser. And a big goal of Cosmos is that it will run on almost any modern computer, including laptops. You don't need a really powerful computer to run this. So the plan for this presentation is going to be I'm going to begin by telling you about what Cosmos, what Cosmos is about, and then I'm going to jump right into a demo. After the demo, then I'll get into the technical details and how this works. So, Cosmos. The problem statement or the reason behind it is pretty simple. For me, I just think it's a really cool idea to have a, a virtual 3D universe and I wanted to do something that was not done before. Now, a little backstory is that before this, um, originally I had done this as a native application. That is something you would have to download and run on your PC. But that has already been done, I noticed. So four weeks ago, I rewrote this entirely from scratch in the web browser. So everything you see here is about four weeks of work. And by the way, every image you see here is from Cosmos. It's not a pre-render, it's not concept art. So this is real from the application. So the goals are a huge universe, hopefully an interesting universe, the universe full of planets, moons, stars, and spanning a really, really large universe. And you can go really fast. So I'm going to jump right into the demo now. So when you start up Cosmos, when you uh, first open it up, you're greeted with uh, a little welcome message. And by the way, this is fairly low resolution, unfortunately, because of the projector. But afterwards, down in the quad, I will be presenting this on a large monitor, high resolution. So the instructions are very simple. You click to navigate, and you use this bar on the left to control your speed. Now we start here, we see a moon. I can click to rotate. So I'm going to click on the center, and I'm going to move the bar up with the scroll bar, and approach this planet, this moon like object. I'm approaching the surface, and as you approach, it, it's intelligent, so it will rotate the viewer automatically upright so that to make it natural to navigate. Now, I'm down here near the surface of this moon and exploring, and you can do, you know, you can look around the entire surface of this, uh, this moon-like object, but what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to back away from this moon and zoom out. So I'm going to keep backing away, backing away, and you'll notice this is an entire star system here. Now, this, uh, this moon that I just uh, backed away from has a neighboring planet. I'm going to approach it. So I'm going to get closer and closer. Uh, look, here it is. And you can see some red appearing. I'm getting closer to it. Zoom in. And here's another planet. So this one kind of resembles Mars a little bit. I'm going to fly around to the uh, to the lighter side of it and go down towards the surface. Every planet in this in this universe is unique. Every single one is different. So, I when I in a few moments I'm going to jump to a different galaxy and I mean, a different star system and we'll see something entirely new. All of this is mathematically generated as well, which means everything you see here is not generated by an artist, but by mathematical equations that I designed. So I'm going to keep backing away. Now that was the star system I just viewed, that little dot there. I'm going to go to another star. And then each star has its own planet. So and I'll just go to this last one as, as the last uh, planet I'll take a look at. So yeah, as you can see, every planet is different. This one actually is a lava, a molten lava planet, it looks like. So I'm approaching here, you can see the glowing lava. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the autopilot and go full speed reverse, slowly, and just show you how big this universe is. So there's a star system. Here's a cluster of star systems going faster, 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 faster. Now what you're seeing now is redshift. We're going backwards so fast, you're experiencing the Doppler effect on light. 
I'm going to stop and go forwards. Now, that's blue shift. So it simulates a Doppler effect. It's, it's not exactly realistic, but it's a nice uh, kind of artistic uh, interpretation on that. And of course, you can explore and billions of planets to explore. I highly recommend you check it out if you get the time. So now I'm going to talk about how this is done. So how is a, 3D, a virtual 3D universe created? Now, naturally, there's a lot of technologies that go into this. I'm not going to have time to give an in-depth overview of everything, um, but feel free to ask as many detailed questions as you want in the question sections, and I'll be down in the quad later. Technology is used. This is a web app, which means you have to use JavaScript, HTML, CSS. There's nothing else you can use in the web. But I did use CoffeeScript, which compiles to JavaScript. That makes it a little bit nicer. I prefer CoffeeScript. Um, GPU, GLSL code, pretty standard. This is through the new WebGL API that enables you to use your GPU's features from your web browser. And just the standard stuff, jQuery, for cross-platform compatibility. And in addition to those, that's the only, those are the only things that I used in the creation of this that were pre-existing. In addition to that, I've created a number of new technologies. So all five of these are ranked in the order that I'm going to present them, not in any particular order other than that. Um, Tuple markup language, a new programming language, query-based rendering, a new architectural system, uh, and a bunch of graphics algorithms that made this possible. Because this does this runs on a laptop, this runs on low-end hardware, this massive universe. It, it, it's not easy to do that if you don't do some special tricks. And so the applications of this technology goes beyond just like a toy universe or video games. It can be applied to medical imaging, anything from from medical imaging, scientific anal analysis. There's a lot of applications, and all this code from this is open source, which means it's free. I'm giving it to anyone who wants to use it. So a high-level overview, um, the goals of this was, of course, to be extremely efficient, to generate all content mathematically, which means nothing was drawn by hand. Every planet you saw was done by a mathematical equation I designed. Um, as much offloaded to the GPU as possible. JavaScript's not that fast, but the GPU can take care of a lot if you can offload that computation there. And this universe is huge. I needed 128-bit precision for coordinates. That's not supported on any CPU right now, on any consumer CPU, so I had to emulate that. So tuple markup language is the first mentioned new technology. This is a, a markup language that I designed. I Mainly just for the reason that XML is kind of complicated and verbose. Uh, it was just something that I wanted to do. Tuba markup language looks like this on the left. It's simpler, it's cleaner in my opinion than XML or HTML. This is not actual code from my project, but it's an example to show you what the aesthetic difference is. And it's free, it's open source, so feel free to use it if you're a programmer and would like to give it a try. Query-based rendering. This is the architecture, the, the kind of the central architecture that makes this massive universe possible. Now the way typically 3D rendering is done in games and simulations is a dynamic update approach. That is to say that you're flying, let's say you're flying through a, a massive area and you keep a list of the objects around you. You add stuff to that list, you remove stuff to that list. As you approach something, you add it to your list, and you back away from something, you, you remove it from your list. But that takes a lot of management, it fragments the heap, it's inefficient, it's complex. My method is simple. You design a central database, a custom database, and every single frame, you issue a spatial query in that database to get all the objects that you're interested in. You take the results from that query, and you render them. It's very simple, it's stateless. So it's very reliable, it's extremely efficient, and it works for literally limitless sizes of universes. Another uh, innovation is what I call sharp normal maps. Now, typically, a normal map is the representation of the uh, norm surface normal in physics of a, of a shape. And typically, surface normals are unit vectors, which means of unit length. And what I've done is I exploited that mit um, so the thing is, a, a vector is three-dimensional, but if you, if you always have one unit uh, in length, that's wasting information. You can scale that length to represent more information. So I use that scale to represent uh, frequency information, and it works in the current hardware, no overhead, no memory overhead, no computational overhead, and it gives you a visual, perceptual uh, result of doubling your resolution. The way it works is you scale down the unit vectors the, the normal vectors 
of uh, points that you want to appear more sharp. That's an intuitive idea. And the way that works is the GP performs linear interpolation between the unit vectors, renormalizes them across the surface of the sphere, and the effect of that is rather than a smooth curve, it will be a rapid nonlinear curve. And here's the, what it looks like. The top is the traditional normal mapping used in every video game today and simulation. The bottom is my improvement. No overhead, zero overhead. And you get that improvement. So star field rendering. The stars that you've seen are all rendered with an extremely simple equation. This is physically inspired but not physically accurate. It's simply one over distance squared in two dimensions. And you saturate the results. The, the end result of that is that you get this nice fall off, this little this glowing effect. So not too complicated, pretty, pretty uh, obvious, but it had an unexpected consequence of having a color banding. So you get a little bit of a different colors at different distances due to the fact that the one over distance squared is performed per channel, red, green, blue, and the saturation occurs at different levels. Planets are rendered uh, three different ways. Distance, they're rendered as a white dot so that you can see them. When you're getting closer, they're low resolution. When you get even closer, they are converted. It begins loading the extremely high resolution data maps. And that's done concurrently, smoothly, so you don't notice that it's happening. Now, actually rendering the planets, actually displaying these planets, it takes, um, there's a number of ways of doing it. You can use polar coordinates. There's all kinds of ways of doing this. The way I did it is with cube to sphere mapping. It's very simple and maps very easily to the, the way computers like two dimensional data structures and it looks good in the end result. If you do a naive uh, cube to sphere mapping, just normalizing the normal vectors on the surface of the cube, it, you get a little bit of distortion as seen on the left. You get, in other words, the corners have smaller uh, rectangular regions than the middle areas. But that can be corrected with some simple adjustment on the equations used. Now, the uh, resolution data sets in this example are 4096 by 4096 by 6 for each planet, and then pre-multiplied again by 1024. Now that's a lot of resolution, and you don't want to render that every single frame all of it at once. So you need some sort of a level of detail algorithm. What that means is you want to render high resolution near the viewer and transition to low resolution in the distance. In other words, it wouldn't make sense to have one centimeter precision at a mountain two miles away. It might make sense to have it in front of you, right in front of you. So the way this works is you want to establish a gradient of uh, geometric resolution. And the way that's done is you, you start with a bunch of grids. You choose one, you subdivide it into four equal resolution grids, and you keep repeating that process until you have the desired resolution gradient. You use a screen, screen space pixel error metric to achieve this. The problem with this, though, is that it can incur a lot of these little grids, a lot of draw calls. That means a lot of commands are being sent to the GPU, and that can be inefficient. If you don't send the GPU enough work, the GPU will be sitting idly and not doing anything and that's a waste of resources. So the solution to this problem, I call it symmetric cluster set level of detail. This was published in SIGGRAPH, uh, I think last year. Uh, this technique uses, I don't have time to explain it in full detail, but the overview is that, if you know, if you know the math, this uses um, symmetric three colorings of the dihedral group D4 to cluster leaf nodes of the quad tree. And in doing so, those clusterings can be used to form any quad tree with a much reduced draw call. And the overall performance improvement of this particular algorithm is 30 to 50% faster than anything else. Now for the really the fine details, you use a different approach. It's called per pixel displacement mapping. Rather than rendering geometric features, you render each pixel on the screen, you determine where it strikes in the high resolution geometry, and you then determine the appropriate color corresponding to that. Now, typical methods of doing this without pre-computation, and this project can't do pre-computation because everything is generated dynamically, typical approaches are more or less brute force. And what that means is um, the, uh, the approach is you start at the surface, you just keep stepping one, by, one after another into the height field until you in encounter an intersection. When you encounter an intersection, you now know more or less where you've struck the geometry and what color to give the designated pixel. The problem with that is it's slow. So here's my optimization. What I do is rather than treating each ray completely separate from one another, I cast out a coarse set of rays, low resolution, spread out very broadly. Each of those rays do the same algorithm to compute the intersection points. Then taking those intersection points, we can compute intervals in which the intersections 
between are likely to occur. Therefore, for the each individual pixel rays, of which there are millions, you can simply isolate which region it, it falls into, find out almost instantly the intersection point. This technique is two to four times faster than any existing technique that does not use pre-computation. And that's been confirmed. There's a paper been written and it's been it's submitted to IEEE Transactions on Visualization and Graphics under review right now. So just as a quick retrospective, things I learned. JavaScript is error prone. CoffeeScript, use it. I highly recommend it. WebGL, support. It's flaky. It's a new technology. It doesn't work in all, all browsers equally, all operating systems equally. It's had a lot of issues on Windows. It works beautifully on Mac, but for whatever reason, WebGL is kind of flaky on Windows. And so just to conclude, this Cosmos integrates cohesive user, design, user interface, user des uh, uh, visual design technologies, new technologies, and moreover, these technologies are applicable to more things beyond just a, a toy universe, even though it is a fun project. So what's next? I hope to make this into a video game at some point. Uh, I'm going to be working full time, so I don't know how likely that's going to be, but I made this in about three weeks of solid work, so it is, it is possible. So thank you. <laughs>
it was tricky, but I did find a way to do that in a way that was clean and not messy, fortunately. But that was pretty tricky. What are the disadvantages of your new approaches uh, versus uh, the current techniques? So should I talk about both of them or? Yeah. Follow? Yeah. So the normal mapping one, the sharp normal maps, no disadvantage to that at all. The uh, chunk level of detail, the, uh, the symmetric cluster set, the only disadvantage of that is you need a GPU that supports a vertex texture fetch. That's a feature that allows your, your vertex programs to access a certain type of memory. So it does require that. Uh, on really old hardware, that may not be available to you. For the displacement mapping one, that has the disadvantage that it's only useful for extremely high resolution, extremely detailed uh, displacement maps. There, the old methods, the brute force, actually works just as fast if you have a really simplistic, kind of like smooth, not, nothing much going on in your detail map. Uh, when it's really complicated, that's when the benefit comes into mind. So that's the limitation is, it's only useful in certain situations. about your, you shift the origin when you're doing rendering. Just out of curiosity, why did you do that over calculating off of the player's position in a fixed grid system? I just could see it kind of being a problem if you were to have multiple players or something like that. It would be kind of hard to keep track of them if you're shifting their origins. Oh, right. So the shifting origin has nothing to do with the global coordinates, I should have mentioned. This is only a part of the render process. So you have all this data, and we want to say, render. Uh, my position onto the screen, draw this stuff. So that's where the shifting comes in. The, the data, like the position of players, for example, that would be a global coordinate. That wouldn't be shifted around. Okay. Are you uh, tracking the adoption around campus? Or, uh, of this? Yeah. This is the first unveiling. Okay. Um, you hope to get some like, user uh, comments? Yeah, I hope to get as, many, as much feedback, as much criticism, as much use as possible. Um, and uh, I'm going to post online a few places too. Hopefully, get some people to that. So we have about two minutes left. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, are there any uh, secret portals where you can Unfortunately, no. Are you Possibly in the future. <laughs> Yeah. I'm doing the best I can getting to work in multiple browsers. Unfortunately, that's one of the disadvantages I found of WebGL. It's a new technology and it's really flaky. And that means Firefox works best. I found. Um, I I added some new planets and then suddenly Firefox stopped working in Windows, and I, I debugged it. It's not my fault. It's it's the implementation. <laughs> Uh, so it's, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. Ideally, you want to just talk directly to the hardware. Everything's in your control. The web browser has this whole foggy layer in between that you're talking through, trying to hope that your commands go through as you expect them to. And if it does something behind your back, there's nothing you can do about it. So yeah, I'll do my best. So any la one last question? Yes. Uh, so you made this um, as an application, like a local application first, and then you moved it to web. Uh, how much of that code were you able to just port over, or did you have to redo like everything? I redid everything. So the old code was in C++ on OpenGL, lots and lots of code. Um, but then I realized, oh, someone else did this in video games or whatever. So I just scratched it, rewrote it from scratch, and it was fun. It was a learning experience. All right, well, thank you.